Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Coming up on Market to Market, economic impacts of a fluctuating ethanol market. Pork producers sharpen their defense against viruses and the ballot box. A voluntary push for electronic identification in cattle. If we could get more competitiveness. And market analysis with Elaine Cobb, next. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, January 28th edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. Two I-words have dominated economic talk for months, inflation and interest rates. The two were big players in this week's economic news. The Federal Reserve all but gave the exact date of when they'll raise interest rates. The movement up contributed to the 11.9% rise in new home sales as would-be owners look to lock in prices before a hike. Durable goods orders fell for the first time in three months, pointing to a pause in the order of items meant to last more than three years. Consumer spending dipped in December by six-tenths of a percent as Omicron and higher prices weighed on the minds of shoppers. Prices rose 5.8 percent in the Personal Consumption Expenditures Index, which is compiled by the Bureau of Economic Analysis. The PCE measures goods and services purchased by consumers. Ford stopped taking orders this week for new Maverick pickup trucks. Now, they did reopen reservations for their electric F-150 Lightning pickup earlier this month. Demand for both models is high, according to the automaker, and price is at the center of most consumer decisions like pickup trucks. And that was a long-time selling point for the renewable fuel industry. Peter Tubbs reports on these and other economic headwinds for the industry. The shift of the transportation sector from internal combustion engines to electrically driven vehicles was a popular topic at the Iowa Renewable Fuels Conference in Des Moines this week. Seth Meyer is USDA's chief economist. And so what we have is a very flat, under current assumptions, a really flat use for ethanol going forward. I think there are opportunities. I think there are definitely opportunities. Some of those opportunities have been talked about here at this forum. You know, you talk about E15 changing the math. You talk about sustainable aviation fuel changing the math. So I think that there are alternatives. While the focus for the event was about increasing the marketplace for renewable fuels, there were discussions on how inflation, expected interest rate hikes, and spikes in input costs are influencing the general condition of the rural economy. Right now, you've got lumber prices rising at unbelievable pace. Fertilizer prices for the farmers out there. The input costs that farmers are facing, and that's particularly important in this part of the country, that's squeezing their margins because they have little control over the price they get for their corn, their soybean, their wheat. Goss, who authors the monthly economic snapshots Emit American Index and Rural Main Street Index from his desk at Creighton University, is finding optimism for the future among rural bankers. Now, our surveys of bank CEOs in rural areas indicate that the, we're still seeing growth. Unfortunately, the growth is probably not enough to compensate for this inflationary pressures, but it's still better off than some states. Meyer sees high commodity prices as a way of helping to offset tapering government payments to producers for losses due to the trade war with China and supply chain chaos from the COVID-19 pandemic. Is a dollar from the government and a dollar from the marketplace spend the same, but they feel different in your wallet. From Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. The headlines around the hog market are of both the domestic and global variety. 
This week, the largest production state was the site of a meeting of industry leaders from across the Midwest. John Torpy filed this report. Attendees at the Iowa Port Congress discussed a wide range of topics from farm security to profitability. Producers went over recent developments with California's contentious Proposition 12. A judge's ruling this week delayed implementation of the measure for 180 days to allow officials time to iron out the fine details. The act mandates minimum space requirements for hog farrowing, egg laying, and veal confinement operations. I mean, I think one of the challenges is just the uncertainty surrounding it. And you know, do you make decisions to comply with California so you have access to their market or not? And I think that headache of that uncertainty, uh, despite the fact that it, you know, maybe was a bit of relief to some of the industry to have that pushed off a bit, it doesn't resolve any of the uncertainty. So I think we're still going to have to live with that for a little bit. Many producers are concerned about Prop 12's impact on the nation's pork supply chain and the prices paid by consumers. And what we found is that there's a, a pretty big drop in, uh, um, potential drop in consumption as a result of some of those folks that are not as economically well off. Producers also attended seminars on disease prevention with an emphasis on African swine fever and last year's outbreak in Haiti and the Dominican Republic. What we've been doing is really providing resources to USDA and, and other experts that are trying to study the issue and, and really knowing how the disease works and how it travels. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. The animal ear tag is nothing new, but making that tag electronic and trackable is a practice that is moving across the livestock community. Colleen Krantz looks at the improvements in technology and a push for a voluntary national system. This newborn bull calf has been given his identification. He is now number five at this Winterset, Iowa farm. His number will be used to track his birth date, vaccinations, and weight as he grows. But when he is sold and leaves his home farm, many of these records will likely be left behind. 60 miles away at the JDH Wagyu farm near Villisca, Iowa, this newborn bull will be identified with a small button-like tag that includes a radio frequency transmitter. When read using a handheld wand, the radio frequency tag will reveal his nationally unique electronic identification, or EID number. His records, pulled into a spreadsheet, could easily travel with him to a new home. From back in the day when we hot-branded cattle with when the old cowboy wrestlers were out there, and we've identified cattle uh, throughout history in different forms and fashions and, and really started to incorporate electronic ID in, in recent years, within the last 10 to 15 years. The 15-digit EID number would not only be associated with a birth date, birth location, and health information, but could also be shared with USDA through a database to rule out or pinpoint affected cattle in case of a serious disease outbreak. Of the top 10 beef exporting nations in the world, um, only two of them don't have a disease traceability system in place today. That'd be us in India, and India mainly exports water buffaloes. That does limit some of our markets there, but you know, even more importantly, I think, um, being proactive here to build a system a, a tool that can be used to limit the spread of a potential disease outbreak, I think is really, really important when we look at not only our food supply, but really our livelihoods as producers. The federal government has, in the past, planned to require the use of electronic identification tags. It announced in March 2021 that it would again delay the most recent plans, but may return to the idea in the future. In the meantime, U.S. Cattle Trace, the Kansas-based nonprofit where Grund is executive director, is trying to establish a voluntary national system for disease traceability. Cattle producers have been concerned about the additional cost. The tags cost more than the standard ear tags, but the larger investment is in the wand and associated computer gear. That equipment can begin around $1,000 and move quickly upward. There is also some legitimate concerns from ranchers that are afraid that um, having electronic IDs would just perpetuate 
and uh, perhaps exacerbate their concerns over lack of competition and consolidation in kind of the cattle slaughter and processing and marketing environment. Dr. Marty Zalewski is more focused on the benefits that EID tags provide to the nation's livestock herd. It allows me to rule out producers and ranchers that may not be involved in a disease event. As an example, in the state of Montana, uh, we were trying to find the source of a cow that was diagnosed with tuberculosis at slaughter. And because of the way that, that cattle and animals are commingled and sold, that animal came out of a feedlot where there was a possibility of 99 possible sources where that animal could have come from. But if that animal had a tag that was able to be read at slaughter and then correlated to her birth premises, you would have been able to hassle and trouble one premises instead of 99. JDH Wagyu president Joe Hoy says although it took a little time to adjust to the EID tags, he now can't imagine getting by without the system. As we scan it, all that information comes to our computer, uh, has the weight on them, their tag number, and any of their previous information we've put in. It's an investment in whatever you're doing, but the cost of the machine and the wand versus spending hours of typing up information and handwriting information and you know not typing in the correct numbers and weights, that can be costly mistakes down the road. Hoy raises Wagyu, a Japanese breed where verifying age, birth premise, and genetic line okay. is particularly important to buyers. The American Wagyu Association as well as organizations that support other breeds, retain much of this data. But the EID system allows for weight and pen locations to be added to inventory spreadsheets. Hoy points out that handwritten records can sometimes be inaccurate. There's lots of opportunity for errors. You can't see it properly or mud or who knows what, but at the end of the day, it's much better with that electronic because it's so positive, you know exactly what you do have. Hoy doesn't lose sleep over the fear that some producers have of being liable if their cattle are proven to be the source of an outbreak. I think there's a little bit of grace there, but maybe I'm wrong. I could be wrong. Um, at the end of the day, I mean, I think most, produ most producers try to do the best they can to make sure they know what they're selling. But there's always diseases that come up. Through U.S. Cattle Trace, producers will continue to test the system and weigh the pros and the cons. From our perspective, we're all producers, and we don't want to mandate anything upon anybody that doesn't want to participate in a program like this. You know, we want good, proactive people that are, that are wanting to build animal disease traceability for the industry. For Market to Market, I'm Colleen Bradford Krantz. Next, the Market to Market Report. Easing tensions between Russia and the world let off a little bit of that pressure valve on the wheat market. For the week, the nearby wheat contract increased eight cents, while March corn added 20 cents. The soy complex approached May of 2021 highs as South American production numbers moved lower. The March soybean contract jumped 56 cents. March meal strengthened 1850 per ton. March cotton expanded 301 per hundredweight. In the dairy parlor, February Class 3 milk futures shed 33 cents. Mixed week in the livestock sector, April cattle improved a dollar. March feeders declined 367, and the April lean hog contract lost two cents. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index increased 164 ticks, or increase that is. March crude oil added a dollar 88 per barrel. Comex gold dropped 46 dollars per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index improved more than 13 points to finish at 622.80. Joining us now to provide some insight is Elaine Cub. Hello, hello, Elaine. Good to be here on a week when markets are up. Yes, yep. uh, you're not going to be on the Angie Setzer uh, <laughs> track of you know sending the markets lower. We'll see how that Hopefully. goes, Fingers right? Crossed, yeah. All right. Asked you before the show, biggest commodity, and you said oil. We're not going to start with oil. We'll get to it. But oil has an impact on all of these markets. Let's start with wheat. Is oil and crude impacting wheat? 
What, let's say that they are both related by some, some, common, some commonalities, right? All commodities, I think, are benefiting at this time when there's so much inflation fear, like you mentioned at the top of the show. I mean, I think uh, investors are piling into commodities as an inflation hedge. And some of the geopolitical stuff that's going on, um, certainly the global oil markets are sensitive to Russia things and wheat markets are sensitive to Russia things. So they share some common things. Natural gas up 24% on the week. That's all tied to it. Now, this, but, but the question, though, that, that it confused me is wheat has now backed off mm. a little bit and the run-up was allegedly about the the Russia Ukraine thing so why has oil and crude or crude and natural gas not moved to the same direction well so the wheat thing actually when I look at the the influence of the Russia situation on wheat I look at the Russian ruble so for the longest time over the past couple of months, there's been a lot of bearishness towards Russia's financial sector, of course. If something happens, nothing has really happened yet, but the fear of that happening kept the ruble going down while the U.S. dollar was going up. And that both of those things together will put a weight on U.S. domestic wheat prices because Russia is such a dominant exporter. I mean, there's something like 35 million metric tons, which is 17% of the global wheat market, export market. So... In this environment where, as you mentioned, uh, the fear sort of subsided here at the end of the week and the Russian ruble popped up a little bit, you did see somewhat, somewhat of a recovery. Okay. Uh, quickly, do we see a bounce back up or down? Right. I mean, uh, does... Famous question. Yeah. Uh, well, what's uh, Vladimir Putin going to do next? I mean, if we could predict that, I think you could make a lot of money on not only wheat, but a lot of markets, a lot of bond markets. A lot of markets are really watching uh, those developments. And corn... Uh, there's a couple of technical issues going on. If we could break a, if we could break 640 uh, on on that March contract, we didn't. But if you can break some certain technical things, we're poised to go even higher, right? Yeah, and it's amazing because honestly, you can think of some bearish things that happened in South America. The South American weather story was sort of bearish fundamentally for both corn and soybeans, and yet prices did keep going up. And I think it's related to what we talked about at the start of the segment here, just the overall demand or um, aspiration to get it long in commodities as an inflation hedge. All right, so what am I doing right now? Uh, am I selling a good percent, a small percent of maybe this new crop? Well, I don't feel a lot of urgency for it because I think these prices are well supported and I don't see major danger in the very near future of them falling apart. Um, especially the South American, you, you were worried about getting more rain there and things really turning bearish, but the Brazilian second crop of corn, uh, the planting and the, and the weather there really hasn't improved it very much. It's sort of beyond hope in some cases. So all of these bearish news weren't even able to bring prices down. So I don't know. I think you just kind of let it go and see what happens. However, if I have a strong local basis right now, mm. do I... How can I say no to something like that? Yeah, the basis actually is in danger of, of weakening just seasonally and also from a transportation um, aspect. There's been the colder weather and we did see some poor rail service metrics. And so we did sort to see some transportation problems, slow service, and that does tend to push back against uh, farm origin prices through the mechanism of weaker basis. Soybeans sound like an auctioneer. I have 14. Can I get 15? Can I get 16? Where, where does this train stop? Well, they are still underpriced in relation to corn, in relation to canola, in relation to palm oil, in relation to basically any other of their comparative markets. You might even say they're still underpriced, but it doesn't mean that they're necessarily heading to $16 or whatever crazy number you just threw out there. Right. And I'm not saying I'm just, but it all of a sudden, I mean, we, a dollar in a week or yeah. two weeks. Yeah. And the chart continues to, to move higher. Um, so I guess I ask you this question. If South America has a smaller crop, dot, 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 for the American producer, what do I do? Yeah, you know, you want to you wanna sell these prices before everything collapses in March or April. But I don't think you necessarily want to be pulling the trigger today because there's still the chance for things to churn a little bit higher. But is there a chance I should maybe take advantage of some Sure. Of and, this move? and not only that, but think of 2022 and you don't have quite as high soybean prices in 2023, even 1240. This La Nina story that has supported um, not only some dryness in North America, but certainly the dryness in South America this winter has been supported by the La Nina phenomenon, which is 67 percent likely to continue for the next couple of months. But then we'll probably neutralize. That's the, the latest thinking from the climatologists. So it's not forever. We, we are not going to have these bullish uh, support forever.
All right, we've talked about grains, so that means we need to set uh, our, our help at home. We're gonna ask Chris in Wisconsin's question, and it's let's keep the three things, the three commodities we just talked about in mind as we talk about this. As we turn to 2022 crop budgets and marketing plans, with the higher input cost, Elaine, do you feel we need to rally or maintain these levels to calculate higher revenue protection guarantees? Not necessarily. There's definitely profit. You can lock in your input costs today, assume that they will be available in the spring, and make you know a dollar and a half, two dollars in profit even. And looking at um, the University of Nebraska put out their crop budgets, and even considering the cost, the extra fuel costs, which is higher, about you know tw twice as much as it was last year, even with the center pivot irrigation, you're looking at maybe for corn uh, an extra 50 cents per bushel on your production cost of production. So that sounds like a lot, but when you consider how much higher the new crop futures prices are, there is profit in there. I don't think necessarily that the markets need to even do anything to make anybody plant corn or, you know, there's some narrative that people would avoid corn because of the higher fertilizer costs, it's still more profitable to grow corn. Well, yeah, especially the price. And we have a couple questions about that. We'll get to Market Plus. But I want to move to livestock. Uh, you were commenting about your drive and, and looking at these animals out there. Uh, let's start with live cattle before we get to feeders. Uh, what do you see the underpins right now? of this live cattle market? Yeah, I mean, the live cattle market sort of is what it is. Didn't have great exports, but the, the cash cattle stayed pretty steady this week, 137 for Southern Live dress deals. So, and that's pretty much right in line with where the futures are. And I think that's kind of stuck there when you look at the, the choice box beef sort of topping out here and staying fairly neutral. There's only so much that consumers can ultimately pay for that beef. And I think we're sort of finding that, that neutral level. It, because we gapped lower on Monday. And there's a, there's a thought that the bears have maybe taken over that market. Well, you're right. And f f from the week, you sort of look at the chart and it looks scary. But as I mentioned, the cash cattle business, the actual profit margins that are there, they continue to be, the same fundamentals continue to be in place. Feeders. We have uh, a couple of things coming up on that. Uh, the big story has been, it's so dry, the feeders are coming off the yeah. pasture early. They're going to go into the lots is that the narrative you hear? So what's really interesting is on Monday, the USDA is going to put out their January 1st cattle inventory report, and then we will finally get some hard numbers on not just the cattle on feed that are in the 1,000-plus head feedlots, but also sort of the backyard feeders, the people who are more likely to bulk at the $6 corn, who are more likely to be feeding these feeders when the corn is cheaper, when it's $3, and you're trying to put some value added in there. So I think that the market will finally see some hard numbers to demonstrate, as you mentioned, the supply tightening that has happened in the feeder cattle market and will continue to happen in 2022 and 2023. The breeding herd just isn't there anymore. That's the, that's the story Chris Swift talked about last week. He's like, the report indicates we don't have those calves coming. Right. And how long does that take to, or will it get resolved? Yeah, well, you look at the futures board, and as you mentioned, it was not great this week. Things really collapsed there in the nearbys. But you look past April, you're still seeing feeder cattle prices at 165 or higher. It's just sort of a seasonal thing here of, of when the buyers are going to get out there and, and want to see those calves coming, coming onto the market. We have a group of young farmers that are watching our show that we're going to have question and answers with in a moment. And I know that there is an old adage of sometimes the younger farmer gets in and expands with yeah. the livestock. If anybody's sitting there watching us right now, should they be looking to buy some calves? Yes, yes. <laughs> buy mine. <laughs> buy yours. Call. We'll get the number after the show. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, let's flip over to the hog market. Uh, that one didn't look good for a while, and uh, does it look good in the future? Yeah, you know, we had a, actually quite a strong export uh, progress this past week and for the past several weeks. You know, there's been... Good move, of course, obviously moving the product to Asia. Uh, the cold storage report was supportive. Everything is kind of supportive for hogs. And not only that, but like John Torpew's story mentioned, the Prop 12 thing has been delayed. So at least that's one ax over the, the, the neck of conventional hog production that has been at least delayed six months. Well, and that was a thing I had written down to talk to you about. You know, what was the role of, of the Prop 12 in the market? It could have been... Nobody really knew, and it could have been a disaster here in January. We would be feeling it now if it was really being enforced in California grocery stores. So for right now, it's, it's you know, a reprieve. As we wrap up here, when you discuss all of these things that we just have, which market do I need to be watching the most closely over the next, let's go, 30 days? Well, um, 
I want to say oil, but I, I'll, I'll shift a little bit and say that Malaysian palm oil, which is really the leader of the global edible oil sector, and that's really what's been leading in some of the cases in the past several months, the soybean crush, and that's sort of the underpinning of, of the value that's coming out of our fields. So that, you know, if we can keep consumers uh, able to pay these prices for edible oils and other cereal grains, you know, then, then we can keep on rolling. Is there any influence by the higher U.S. dollar on any of the things you talked about that we need to be concerned about? Yeah, and especially like the pork exports, the beef exports. I do wonder, especially those beef exports that were a little disappointing this past week, I wonder if the stronger dollar wasn't, hasn't been part of that or won't continue to be more of that as we go forward. Okay. Eli and Cobb, thank you so much. I always appreciate the time. Glad to be here. All right. That will do it for this installment of the TV show we call Market to Market. We're going to keep talking in Market Plus, so you can join us there. Find that on our website of markettomarket.org. You know, there are no snow days in our Market to Market classroom. We have modules on the role of government, science and technology, and the 1980s farm crisis available at markettomarket.org slash classroom. I was so excited to say slash. Next week, we look at the cost of expanding the use of medical marijuana. Thank you for watching. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.